As conversations over the water resource bill build up, Nobel laureate Professor Wale Shoinka bears his mind on the proposed legislation. And while APC insists resident electoral commissioner Mike Guinea was frolicking with Governor Basaki, some interest warned politicians against unfounded allegations. This is Plus Politics. I am Coyote Ladende. Once again, you're welcome to Plus Politics. The National Water Resource Bill, which failed to secure a concurrent passage by both houses in the 8th Assembly, has now in the current 9th Assembly passed second reading in the House of Representatives and has been referred to a House committee. This has sparked up several reactions, especially condemnations from several quarters across the country. Joining us to discuss this is the Nobel laureate, Professor Wale Shoinka, who now joins us via Zoom to discuss this issue and some other national issues. Good evening, Prof. Good evening. Yeah, good to have you again. No thanks to the network when we wanted to hear your take on this issue. But let's hope that network will be very friendly with us tonight. <laughs> I hope so, too. Okay, let's start with uh, a statement credited to you. Uh, I know uh, someone represented you, but let's confirm whether this statement actually came from you. Uh, what do you think about uh, describing it as the National Water Resource Bill is a deliberate flanking move towards Ruga colonization? The word Ruga came up again. What exactly do you mean, Prof? Well, there's no other way in which I can describe it. <clears throat> when you take over the water resources of any society, of any country, any, any space, whatever, and you demarcate a certain distance from that water source, right, left, north, south, etc., it means you can do whatever you want on uh, that landed uh, estate, that uh, real estate. Um, we won't even begin talking about the, the fish in the water and all other uh, habitats of the, of the water. Let's look at the land alone. It means you can push a project like Ruga there and uh, nobody can complain because you've already taken that space over. And I find that outrageous. Hmm. Uh, that's, a, that's another word uh, we're looking at. Uh, when you say Nigeria will be doomed if this uh, bill is passed, uh, without being uh, misrepresenting you, uh, can you also throw more light on that? Well, look, this is not an isolated issue. It's in the context of the kind of regime this has turned out to be, which has proved itself to be a very partisan, uh, sectarian kind of regime with very limited scope of what it considers its constituency. And that narrow constituency is like a tail which has been wagging the dog. And it's becoming more and more apparent every day. I mean, when you decide to take control of a, a people's water resources, you literally telling them that their primary, the primary source for existence is in control centrally of a place which has no notion and no immediate uh, association with the environment over which it's legislating. Now, that's a very, very provocative kind of action. That's why I say if this bill is passed, this nation is doomed. That's very... Uh, okay, let's, let's also look at uh, the intention and for those proponents who believe that uh, why should we have this kind of suspicion. Uh, the cited um, Western climes like the UK where the water is well regulated and they also mentioned the idea of meeting up with the SDGs where uh, there is a kind of pipe bomb water provided for everyone. So basically, uh, can we give them some benefit of doubt? 
You know, let, let's, let's ask them instead, just what has happened astronomically that warranted intervention with the way the water resources of this nation have been managed before? Just what has happened in the meantime to the stratosphere? Oh, we know there is um, global warming, et cetera, et cetera. But what has happened since this regime took over, you know, environmentally, that warrants this kind of uh, legislation? And those who support it, let them come out and tell us. Let them come and debate it. I, for one, am willing to meet with them, and I'm sure there are hundreds of others, and debate it publicly. Let them just tell us what has happened that warranted their leaving some very critical issues over which they have failed so far. And then, is this a diversion? Is this a game? Uh, is it that there's a predetermined agenda somewhere? No, let them tell us what warranted bringing up this bill, especially after it has been rejected. Okay, now talking about the rejection, in the 8th Assembly, uh, quoting you now, you did say that, uh, a, um, let me, okay, I have it on the screen, a roundly condemned project blasted out of sight by public outrage one or two years ago is being exhumed and sneaked back into service by none other than a failed government and with the consent of a body of people supposedly elected to serve as custodians of the rights, freedoms, and existential exigencies of millions. Now, uh, Prof, we're looking at whatever debate, some are even saying let it not even get to a public debate, it should be thrown out, but still trying to listen to them. Uh, we're looking at how, what is the alternative, if at all, this bill needs to be reintroduced in a better way? What are those clauses you have issues with? Is it the fact that they have to take care of the fish, or it shouldn't be controlled by the federal, it should be controlled by the state? What are exactly your grouses against it? Well, again, I keep saying to people, look at everything in the global context. This nation has been screaming uh, restructuring, which, uh, taken as broadly or as narrow layers alike, really amounts to decentralization. You know, there's some major issues, issues of uh, uh, revenue generation, distribution of resources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and this should be looked at within that context. In other words, while turning a deaf ear to issues of economy, restructuring, decentralization, then even some natural resources, which have not been at issue before, are now being centralized. Now, what kind of uh, progression or retrogression is that? It means that uh, the people are at variance with this government, with the state. And when that happens, uh, it means that there is going to be conflagration without any question. Still talking about conflagration. I, I'm just looking at it that uh, we deserve some pipe bomb water in all uh, areas, for example. I think you also touched on that. When people explain why sh we've seen blocks of flat, like 10 blocks of flat, where each house digs a, a, a borehole. And but from what environmentalists have said, they said this is a dangerous uh, move by people. So how do we have a way of regulating it? You have, been a much, you have been around much longer than many of us, that there was a time where we had water being, you know, controlled by the government. So how have we degenerated to this level and how can we come back to have this water well regulated like we have in other civilized climes? Well, I would say that the first step is, first of all, for this regime and the legislative houses, which very strangely, I'm astonished. I really, I mean, anything can come out of the presidents or can deal with that. But really what shocks me is that people who've been elected, you know, within, from within immediate constituencies, which involve survival, generation of means of uh, existence, of enhancement of existence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, coming from those who haven't even seen piped water for donkey years, but have been relying on natural resources for cooking, bathing, etc., etc., watering, irrigation. And suddenly this incompetence, this a government which has proved in 
capable of providing potable water, of providing even water for uh, against COVID to ensure that you have running water so you can wash your hands and so on. Somebody wants to take over the resources of this nation to do what with it? the water resources? And in addition, the land adjoining these water resources, whether underground or above ground, I mean, what kind of confidence does one impose on repose in a government like that? So live well alone if you have proved yourself incapable of improving the quality of life of the people in this particular uh, context, with this particular resource. Don't take on any additional burden on yourself, mm. because to start with, you will fail. That's number one. Number two, it's provocative, because there has been a program. There's been a program, it's called RUGA, in which this very government attempted to uh, sort of corral areas at will all over the states in order to accommodate one of the many businesses run by this nation. And that program has been rejected outside. And you and I know very well that this is one conduit towards actualizing that rejected program. It makes people lose confidence in the government, even in other directions where it may be it is being positive. So I don't know if I've taken over your question, but I'm trying to look at this whole thing and to make people understand that we cannot see this merely as an isolated instance, but as part of a very sinister agenda. Hmm. Talking about the sinister agenda, Prof, I, I, I'm tr still trying to look at it that technically, uh, Ruga seems to have been completely resisted, probably by you and some other people who stood against it. So um, uh, why should we express some bit of suspicion that uh, Ruga will come in through this control or control of uh, water resources? Well, what happens? I come from Ogun State, for instance. We have a river there called Ogun River. Suppose tomorrow, now, a certain squad or whatever, whether hooved or booted, uh, the squad comes along and says, all right, this portion of your land now belongs that comes under the control of the federal government because this bill has been passed. And in the wake of that squad, you know, um, whatever, whether it's cattle or sheep or pigs, I don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. And they say we are now under federal control. This area is now belongs to the government, to the central government, and we can do what we want with it. And so today we are driving pigs to take over that life. I'm putting it as crudely as I can and as simplistically as I can because I want people to understand the implications of this before we go even further. So what happens? Of course, there's conflict. There's conflict here, there's conflict there. The security forces cannot cope with that kind of conflict. It's obvious. They have enough on their hands without generating new areas of antagonism between people and government. So why are they embarking on it? Why? Are there not more important critical issues with which this government is confronted and which requires the collaboration and the, the assistance even of the people themselves? Why are they antagonizing people? What is the purpose? Okay, while we wait for answers to be provided, and you've also stated clearly here that uh, you will be interested in being part of that public hearing and uh, we'll hope that uh, whatever is going to be done Nigerians will not be kept in the dark. Uh, let me just take advantage of uh, having you speak on some other national issues because of our time. Let's start with um, I think everywhere is your sphere but let's start with uh, the issue of Unilag and the drama that happened where the uh, pro-chancellor suspended the vice-chancellor and the intervention of the president. Now, what do you make of this, at least, if there's any lesson to be learned so that we don't have a repeat of such a drama that happened in Unilag? Yes, I'm very sad about Unilag. As you know, I consider myself an alumnus of that place. I taught there. And uh, it was part and parcel, if you like, even the, uh, the inauguration of that uh, 
university, and so all of us are unhappy about it. But what I would like to request is that we allow, uh, since things have gone this far, and they should never, we should never have arrived at this state, so it's gone so far, let, let the panels, et cetera, et cetera, which have been set up, let them finish their work, and then we'll comment. At this stage, I think it's better not to comment. Let's just say that the, uni the principle of university autonomy happens to be something I have believed in all my life and I've worked towards. And so it's very distressing when I see intervention on this level, on this visitorial level, which apparently is permitted, of course, by the constitution of the university itself. So once that has begun work, let's wait and see how it peters out, and then we'll make comments. Okay. Um, as much as uh, we may also want to say that the MBA issue has also rested where the governor of Kaduna State was disinvited after being invited initially. And now as we speak, we have some lawyers from the North forming their own MBA. And um, I, st I stand to be corrected. That seems to be the first time that MBA will be having faction or some form of balkanization. What, what do you really think? about how the thing turned out from Aurofy to being disinvited and um, just your take on it, sir. Governors seem to be very much in the news these days and very often for the wrong reasons. Um, my feeling about this is that uh, once they had invited him, first of all, any organization has a right to invite or disinvite, I, I believe. That. If, if an issue comes up, let's say you invited somebody to come and speak on child protection, and it turns out that child, I mean, that person happens to be a pedophile, then obviously you have a right to say, sorry, we made a mistake, etc. But this is not the case. Uh, and so this particular case, I think it's unfortunate. Once they had invited him, they should have let him come and then taken him to task over issues which made them consider disinviting him. Uh, this is the opportunity to have dialogue. It's very different. Uh, I, I spoke earlier about governors being in the news. Very different from a situation of uh, the governor who says he's going to sign a death warrant uh, the moment he's given the go-ahead by the court. Death warrant on somebody who, um, who uh, he is, it is claimed happened to blaspheme against the avatar, the prophet, the, you know, the principal, holy uh, personage of that religion, and then you sentence that kind of person to death. Now, if I were, if the NBA had invited that person, see, that's why I say we must be very careful and take cases like this one by one. If the NBA had invited that person to come and address them, and then in the meantime, that governor who has a, a backload, a load on his head to start with, but that's irrelevant, we can talk about that later on, then says that he will back capital punishment under a theocratic law in a secular nation. I would say that the NBA would have a right to tell him to please turn around and go back to his uh, theocratic constituency. It's very different, you see, from the case of Terrify, uh, who's just accused of, uh, of not, uh, shall we say, being a good lawyer, a good member of the association. So I'd like us to be very careful about general principles and individual situations and not allow. For me, I'm more concerned, for instance, about what that governor, Ganduje, is about to do to a Nigerian citizen than I am. I've not exercised by whether Elrufai is invited or is invited. Well, I am in a way, but not as much as I am by the fact that a governor wants to go and hang an individual who is accused of having blasphemed against one of the many prophets that we have in this world and in this country. Oh, Prof, thank you for going into the issue of Kano. And by extension, I think your position is very clear, very, very unambiguous. Now we have another issue, the issue of Kama and we see churches quite the umbrella body, the sub body, saying that uh, they have some issues with the law. Uh, what's your take about the Kama? Well, why is there so much emphasis about the Christian religion? Why? 
uh, many religions in this nation. Why are we talking about mosques as well? I, I'd be surprised if the, uh, if the Muslims do not also take up issue with Kama. Because we keep saying, as secularists, as absolutely convinced and committed secularists, that, the gov uh, that uh, theocracies have no business with government. Vice versa, governments should have no business with theocracies and uh, with religion, right? Distinction, please. Now, um, you cannot, the government cannot say religious bodies should be subject to secular laws. No, that's wrong. Otherwise, you have a right, the religious bodies have a right to say, yes, yes, we're just another arm of governance, therefore, we have a right to set up theocracies. So, we must reject this kind of mutual intervention. Now, there are laws, and those laws are constantly being applied. They cut the papers one day, and we find there is a rapist, a uh, Christian or Muslim, a pedophile, rapist or uh, uh, Muslim or Christian, etc., etc. And there are laws which take care of individuals. We have a robbery, we have malfeasance, we have misappropriation of funds, and the laws exist which take care of those. And then all the time people are talking Christianity, Islam. Are those the only religions in this nation? There is the religion of the Orisha, which preceded Christianity and Islam. So what about them? Well, what's, what's all this concentration on, on these foreign religions anyway? Um, I would like to see the government try and change the board of trustees uh, in a, an Ogun setting or a Shago setting and see what happens to them there. But if they flout the law, then they are subject to those legal protocols which bind everybody together. Uh, and so you cannot, on the one hand, say that you can hang somebody for something in one part of the country when he's free to uh, conduct himself in the same way as another part of the country, uh, and then say we are the same uh, nation. Yet, at the, same, at the same time, you say you have the right to intervene. Then why isn't the state interfering in the case of this young man, this musician, who's been sentenced to death for alleged blasphemy? So everything is cockeyed. We've got to come together and really make up our minds what kind of a society we are. Are we a secular society? Or, as some people like to, you know, like to be pedantic and say, you know, we're not secular, we're multi-religious. All right, let's say you're multi-religious. Multi-religious country, that means that those religions cannot speak to governance, vice versa, unless those religions flout the legal protocols of association, bind us together, the government should please take their noses out of the businesses of those religious voters. Uh, oh, good. Uh, let me just quickly talk on two issues before we let you go, sir. Uh, let's look at uh, what you mentioned about the canoe, and uh, this might also help the younger generation to also understand what really transpired. How Sharia law was adopted in some states in the north, and how the president kicked against it, and he later got uh, um, into the system where they will say that as long as you submit yourself, to the, the theocracy part of the state, you, you're bound by those laws. So what exactly are you saying? Are you saying that uh, that man should have been, you know, should have been taken care of by the secular law and not the Sharia law? Prof. The Sharia uh, system itself is uh, a subject for extensive and comprehensive debate in this nation. Uh, operating the Sharia law, quote unquote, for instance, uh, there have been killings, you know, extrajudicial killings, even under judicial law. We have had situations where governors who set up this, their Hisbar, have uh, mobilized them, attacked hotels where drinks were being sold. We've had cases where uh, lorry drivers who are just doing their own normal business, importing, exporting uh, 
drinks, so-called alcoholic drinks, have been brought down. I'm going back in history now, you understand, this is nothing new, by the way. Only it has to be dissolved now. We had them pulled down necklaces, we checked. We had uh, assaults on religious processions. Uh, we've had demands uh, for the entire nation to observe theocratic laws, which apply, supposed to apply only to those who adhere to that, uh, to, to that particular theocratic uh, system. I, I think it's about time that we just stop beating around the bush and ad hocing, uh, improvising, and really define the various territories of the theocratic authority in this nation. We've had the uh, an assault on the capital of this nation, on the fixed, which is supposed, which is not <laughs> any kind of uh, on uh, theocratic uh, something. We had the assault because a beauty contest was going to take place there. We had hundreds of people killed. Till tomorrow, we have assaults on all kinds of, not even one religion against another, but even sects, one sect against another. And the problem, the problem is that the secular laws we bind all of us together have not been administered. In most cases, we do not see the exercise of crime and punishment. So what we do is just improvise. And we swallow the insolence, the arrogance, the imperial mentality of some religions in this nation put the rest of us at risk. What is the result of these years, these years of abandonment of responsibility? Boko Haram, Iswa, and Swadin. We've been, at, we've been under threat by neighboring countries, north, when those uh, religious fundamentalists uh, come and assault the rest of us. We have expre inhibiting expressions like uh, Islam above, uh, Islam above. <laughs> when you criticize, you say, oh yeah, you hate our religion. But don't we also have religious maniacs? Don't we also have mm. religious fanatics who actually corrode the very basis of society? Those who don't even respect those of us who say, we don't believe in your religion. Now leave us simply alone and let us organize a humanistic system of coexistence. So you've touched on a very large subject, and I, I don't want us to trivialize it, to oversimplify it. I'm just saying it's about time that we all came together and sat and decided what kind of a nation we are. And let's not regret, let's not go back to those days when attempted coups were made, in which demands were made that certain states should be excised. You know, you remember that, don't you? Okay not just secession, but saying, you, because you don't believe in the rest of us, please get up. Let's not go back to that kind of approach, in which we say, if you hang this man, we're going to work for that state to be excised from the rest of the nation. Wow. Because that's where we're heading right now. Okay, Prof, let, let, let us take this as a bonus. Um, I'd like to get your take in the next 60 seconds on what is going on in Mali. Um, is I know what you've done about the issue of military takeover. Is this an exception where you have your kind of endorsement? No, I'm afraid I can't. I think one year is even too long to give to those people. You should have given them one month. They interrupted something. Putting that something back together should not take more than a few weeks. Um, at the same time, and when, when I try to give credit, people say, oh yes, you're backing this, you're backing this. But I like to be very fair. We moved positively. We, we made some progress. Time was when Yari, Yarima, that criminal you know, over there, when he would have stayed there forever and ever, Equus moved and told him it's time to get out. Because there are successes. This one, the same thing. But I think they were too gentle with him. And I believe that we should say, not Jonathan back, but uh, maybe your son, I think it's a bit more tougher than Jonathan. Send him go and tell them, listen, get out of there another month, or else we're going to starve you out. Thank you very much, Professor Walisho Ikao, the Nobel laureate. Thank you for your intervention on this many national issues. And uh, those issues that you said that we have actually opened, maybe some other time, 
we'll have the opportunity to have you expatiate more on them. Thank you for your time, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, uh, we will take a short break, and when we return, we'll go over to a state where politics thickens. Please don't go anywhere. <laughs> 